As Katya mentioned, what I'd like to talk about is functional parsing for novel markup languages. Uh, talk about what they are and why we need them. So the way I got into this was that when I retired from my day job as a mathematician, I decided for various reasons that I wanted to try to build a web app for editing and pub publishing mathematical documents. And you can use it for other things too. You know, physics is fine, computer science is fine. Uh, yeah, you can do lots of things with it. And uh, I'd like to thank the Simons Foundation, which gave me some support along the way. And what's come out of this is the screenshot of this little web app that you see here, scripta.io. It's built with Elm, which is a pure functional language that compiles to JavaScript. So it's a great tool for creating web apps. And I use Lambda, which is a system that allows you to write Elm for both the front end and the back end. So I don't have to deal with, uh, you know, Postgres databases, which, you know, I basically love, but the fewer things I have to deal with, the better. And uh, the front end and the back end in Lambda communicate by a web socket. So the, uh, the communication is much faster and there's much less latency than there would be if I were making HTTP requests. So if you look at the screenshot, you see three windows there. There's a text editor on the left in green. There's the rendered text in the middle. And there's a list of documents that the user, which is me in this case, is working on. The pink arrow relates to one of the main design requirements, which is that the rendering of the text should be instantaneous. Now, what this means is that whenever the user types something, even a single character, the rendered version updates essentially immediately. And immediately or instantaneous means from the point of view of the user's perception, of course, not from the point of view of physics. The other design requirement is that there be in-place, real-time error handling. And you can see why this is necessary in a real-time editing system, because if the document is supposed to be rendered in real time, it will often be in an error state. I mean, you start typing a, I don't know, a left bracket that's supposed to be matched by a right bracket, and well, it's, that's not done instantly. So there's an error there, and the parser has got to parse the entire document. Uh, it's got to render the text after the error or the errors are encountered in some reasonable fashion. I mean, if you've used LaTeX, which is the standard tool for mathematicians, uh, you've probably experienced this problem where you, you open an environment or some other expression and you forget to close it or you close it in the wrong way, and then all the stuff after that is all messed up. The other thing is, is that you need for the parser and the renderer to co cooperate in such a way that when you do make an error, it's noted in the render text in some visible, you know, fairly discreet but yet helpful way. And so for all of these things, you need to have a suitable fault-tolerant parser. So, uh, you know, there's lots of prior and related work. I'm certainly not the first person to encounter this problem. I'm not nearly as familiar with it as I'd like to be, but I would like to recognize, first of all, the work that Matt Griffith did on Elm Markup. Uh, it's a, another markup language, as the name indicates. And I've learned a lot and do a lot of inspiration from that. And I'd also like to recognize the work that Rob Simmons and his team did at Brilliant.org. Uh, Brilliant makes really, really good educational software in the STEM fields. And their educational offerings are powered by Elm, and in particular by the parser that Rob and his team designed. And I worked on a little part of that parser for a time and learned a, a great deal from them. Um, so, uh, which markup languages might one uh, apply this to? Well, for mathematicians, the obvious choice is LaTeX or some cousin of it. So, I'll talk a little bit about Micro LaTeX, which is the version used in Scripta.io. Or it might be X Markdown, which is, uh, you know, a cousin of Markdown. It can do mathematics and a few other things. But what I want to concentrate on is a novel markup language of which I am currently the only user called L0. Uh, I, when I described this to a friend of mine, he told me that, well, you know, you're not the first person to design a language called L0. It's actually rather common. Uh, whether there is an L1 or an L2, who knows? But anyway, it's a very simple markup language. Uh, it's, despite its simplicity, it's fairly expressive. 
And I wanted to have some kind of a very simple test bed for working out my ideas on fault-tolerant parsing. So that's why I started with that. Once I sort of understood it, I integrated to handle these other two markup languages that Scripta will, will take care of. So let's look at a little piece of L0 text. You see it there in pink. And uh, it consists of four blocks or paragraphs. When rendered, it looks like this. So you see uh, you know, a big fat title. You see an image of a bird. You see a theorem. But I want to concentrate just on this line here. So you see that um, the word real is rendered in blue italic text. And the question is, how, does that, how do you accomplish that? Well, look at the source text. You see that the word real is nested inside this little element. I call it a function element. It begins with the left bracket, the name of the function, which in this case is blue, the word real, which is the body of the function, and it closes by a right bracket. So a function element is left bracket, function name, body, right bracket. And that's nested inside another function element, which is uh, uh, an I element, so I for italic and blue for blue, and that's why that text is rendered in blue. So that's the, the main construct in L0. The only other construct in pure L0 is just pure text, so it has text elements and function elements, and in order to handle mathematics and code, there is one other kind of thing, a so-called verbatim element, which is bounded on the left and right by either dollar signs for math or backticks for code. And that's it, three contexts, three constructs. Um, now, there's also a block structure, which I'll come back to at the end of the talk, but the, uh, the most interesting part for the, from the point of view of uh, error handling is the uh, language that you see in the body of the blocks, the L0 language. Okay, so time, if I can pull this off for a little demo. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so there you see uh, scripta.io, and I want to just look at two things. So, first of all, you'll notice that in this section called errors, there is some pink text. Let me actually fix something here. I want to have another error. Okay, so we have, uh, and then let me make some, a few more errors. I, okay, I forgot to do that. Okay, very good. Okay, so if you look at the first one of these, these you say this is and then left bracket i is rendered with a pink background, and that's because the left bracket in the source text, which you see over here, is not matched by a corresponding right bracket. So that's the idea. You want to have some visual representation of where the error occurs in the rendered text. And, well, I should do things in the source text too, but I, you know, there's only so much I can do at any one time. Uh, so you notice a couple of things. One is that after that error, the the rest of the text appears. It's not absent or messed up in some horrible way. And moreover, if you look at the second example, you'll see that, well, there there are two nested elements, but one of the right brackets is missing. And so once again, you see a little indication of the error, and the text, colored italic text, is still rendered in blue. So the idea is that the parser and the renderer should cooperate to render things as well as you know, it can be without a knowledge of the author's intent, okay? And notice that if I, uh, you know, for example, put in a right bracket there, it instantly corrects it, okay? And I won't dwell on this, but you see below where I have uh, a missing dollar sign. If I put that, it's indicated in pink again. If I, the red, by the way, is intentional because I have a, a, a red function element after that. And the same here if I put in this uh, back tick, if I can, well, I'm not sure I can find it, so I, I'll just admit that. There's one other thing that I wanted to do, which is let's look at this document here. Okay, so this is, um, this is written in micro LaTeX. I used to call it mini LaTeX, but I, I like the, the sound of micro LaTeX better. So the only thing I want to show you is that it is indeed fairly fast. So I'm going to uh, cut out all of the document, if I can manage to do that, except for the title. Just a second, I'm having a little trouble getting down to the bottom here, but I'll get there eventually. Come on, come on, let's keep going. Um, well, there is Command A. Okay, well, let me try Command A. Okay, I have the whole thing. 
I now have a blank document, and now I'm going to paste it back in, and I want you to see how fast it renders it. Okay, it's basically instantaneous. Okay. And um, a few other things, you know, the table of contents, uh, I, it's generated automatically, it's live, I can go backwards and forwards. Uh, and if you look in the footer, there's an export button so I can export micro LaTeX to standard LaTeX and, you know, send it off to my publisher. Ha ha ha. <laughs> or I can press the PDF button, and if I wait a suitable amount of time, then it will send me a PDF version of the file. Okay. And the way it does that is it, um, it first of all exports it to standard LaTeX, then it ships it off to a little server someplace where it's actually a, a Haskell program, only 200 lines long, that runs LaTeX twice, then it, turning it into PDF and sends a link back to the PDF document. Okay. So that's all that I want to do in the way of demos, uh, but at least to show you that it's not total vaporware. Uh, uh, and it's, it's gradually getting better. It's not yet ready to be released, but I have a few people who are using it and, you know, giving me suggestions and bug reports and so forth. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's study the parser now. Uh, so the first thing, this is actually what I always do when I do a project like this. I f instead of, uh, you know, I, I first write the type down for the syntax tree. That's the beginning. So here's the type for the syntax tree. Uh, it, uh, it, it's the expression type, and it just has three variants, function, text, and verbatim, one for each of the elements of the L0 language, okay? And if you look at the function type, for example, it has, uh, I don't know what you call these things, parameters or something or other. Anyway, the first thing, the string, is for the name of the function. The body is a list of expressions, so this is, a, you know, that's where the recursion comes in. And meta is something I won't spend any more time talking about except to say that it contains additional data like, uh, you know, uh, where, is, where is this located in the source text? It also has a unique ID and a token index and various things that are used later on down the compiler pipeline. Okay, so if you look at some source text like this is brackets I strong stuff, and you run the parser, then you get this list of expressions. You get a text variant for this is, a function variant for the italic element with body strong, text strong, and then a final text, text variant. Okay? If you uh, look at some code with, or some source text with math in it, then it will parse like this, a text variant and then a verbatim element. And I didn't mention it, but if you sort of remember what was up on the screen, the way the verbatim variant goes, it's verbatim, string, string, meta. The first string is the name of the verbatim element, and the second uh, string is the body of it. So in this case, the body is that formula. Okay, so let's take a look at the overall parser data flow, and we'll sort of gradually dive deeper and deeper into it. So we'll, we'll begin with some source text. In this case, it's two nested function elements. And the first thing you do is you tokenize it. Now, until I got into this project, you know, I, I, when I did mini LaTeX, I did it entirely using parser combinators. And here I use parser combinators to extract tokens, but then, uh, you know, I, I'll then pr I extract tokens and then I'll parse them and I'll process them in some other way. So the next thing to do is to do the parsing proper. And there you see the list of expressions that that produces. And they're going to be produced by running uh, what turns out to be a shift reduce parser. And uh, so I'll talk about that algorithm now. Uh, I'll tell a little story here. <laughs> when I was working at Brilliant, um, you know, I was working on this very nice configurable parser that uh, Rob and his team had built. And uh, we were sort of trying to understand better what it does. And he, and one day he says, well, Jim, I think this is a shift-reduce parser. So I, I didn't, I'd heard the word, but I didn't really know anything about them. So I studied up, and I came back the next day and said, yeah, Rob, we are doing a shift-reduce parser, by golly. So, uh, so anyway, we're going to implement this using a functional loop. And uh, a quick review of those. In Elm, you implement functional loops using the step type. So it's a type with two type parameters. It has two variants, loop and done. 
And the best way to see what those two variants do is to look at the little l loop function. It takes two arguments, a state and a function that transforms a state value into a step value. And the way it works is this. You apply the next step function, whatever it is, to the state, and will re it will return either a loop variant or a done variant. If it returns a loop variant, then you apply the next step function to t, the state that it returns. If it returns a done variant, then, well, you're done, okay, and you return b. And the state that will operate in this parser uh, is the record that you see at the bottom of the screen. It has four fields, a list of tokens, an index into the token list, a stack of tokens, and a list of committed expressions. So the committed expressions are the ones that are uh, created during the operation of the loop, and once, as the name indicates, an expression is pushed onto that list, it's not changed any further. Okay, so let's see how this next step function works. Well, the first thing you do is you try to get a token out of the state. And of course, the way you do that is you look at the index into the token list, and if it's a valid index, you return just that token, and otherwise you return nothing, okay? So let's look at each of those two branches. Uh, if in the nothing branch, you first ask, is the stack empty? And if it is, then you know two things. The stack is empty, you've processed all the tokens, and that's an indication that you have uh, done your processing without error, and so you return the state, which contains the list of committed expressions. Uh, in the contrary case, you have to invoke an error recovery function, and that's actually where the, where the big fun comes in, and I'll get to it eventually. In the case where you return a token from the, uh, th from the state, you do the following. You, we're going to modify the state in several stages. We first of all advance the token index, and then we either push or commit the token. And there's a very simple rule for this. You look at the token and you look at the stack. If the token is a string token and the stack is empty, then you convert that token into a text variant of the expression type and you push it onto the committed list. In the contrary case, you push the token onto the stack, okay? And the next thing you do, so that's the shift operation of a shift reduce parser, okay? The next thing you do is you look at the stack and you ask yourself, is it reducible? Reducible means that you can apply some other function that will process the elements on the, st on the stack and turn them into a valid uh, value of type expression. Okay, so that's what is reducible does. If the answer is yes, then it applies that reduction function, which I've called reduce here. It uh, will take that value and push it onto the committed list. Okay, and then it will clear the stack. Okay, if on the other hand, the stuff on the stack is not reducible, it just returns the uh, state as it is, We've handled the two cases for apply if, and then we continue the loop. So the, the high-level operation of this is very simple. There are really two interesting parts of it. Well, there are two parts, one of which is interesting. Push or commit is very simple. So all of the intellectual work has to go into the uh, is reducible and, and the reduce function. Okay? Uh, so let's think about reducibility. Now we actually have to think about both reducibility and reduction of a list of tokens to a value of type expression. But it turns out that the logic in both cases is essentially the same. It's just that at each stage in the code, instead of returning a Boolean value, you'll build up an expression. And for reasons of time and patience, we'll just look at the reducibility algorithm. So is reducible is gonna do the following sort of thing. If I present it with a token list, it will first of all throw away all the information that is irrelevant for the purpose at hand and return either true or false. Now in this case, the symbols, the stuff in pink, uh, consists of a, let's call it a valid symbol list because it begins with an L for left bracket, it ends with an R for right bracket, and it's just strings in between, 
Okay? On the other hand, if I give it an incomplete token list like this, the symbol list, well, it's also incomplete, and we return false. So the question is, how do we, how do, we do this? And we're going to do this by implementing two mutually recursive functions. Uh, the first one is reducible, is the one I mentioned before. Its type is list symbol to Boolean. And its companion is has reducible args, which has the same type signature. And we'll see how they, they work in, in just a sec. So let's look at is reducible first. So I'm going to explain it by looking at two possible inputs. Let's look at this list of symbols. So it's going to work by pattern matching, like practically everything here. And when we pattern match it, we see that uh, the first two symbols are matched, and then there's some stuff left over. That's the rest, OK? And what we do is we uh, ask, uh, is the last symbol of the rest an R? And if it is, we're going to apply has reducible args to the rest of the symbols, the pink stuff, minus the last one, OK? And as we'll see on the next slide, that will return true. And so in this case, we see that is reducible does the proper thing. Let's look at one more uh, example, the orange symbols that you see up there. Again, we pattern match. Uh, L and ST are matched, and there's more orange stuff that has to be taken care of. We're going to apply has reducible args to that, and I have to convince you that that will return true. OK, so let's do the other function in this pair of mutually recursive functions. So we'll look at both possible inputs, the pink ones and the orange ones. And again, it's going to operate by pattern matching. So this time, the list of symbols matches the second pattern. What's left over is an empty list. And uh, let's see, our code says, well, apply has reducible args to that. But that matches the first pattern. And there we return true. So we're done with that one. OK, so let's look at the second example, a little bit longer list of input symbols. And this time, it's going to match the third pattern. And this time, uh, well, we do something a little bit different. We split the symbol list into a prefix and a suffix. The prefix is going to be the uh, shortest list of symbols that begins with an L, ends with an R, and has nothing else in between. And the suffix will be what's left over. So there it's split into green and orange things, the prefix and the suffix. And we're going to apply is reducible to the prefix. And well, we've thought about that before. That's going to return true. And we're going to return, has re, we're going to apply has reducible args to the suffix. And uh, well, that's going to return true also. We just saw that, OK? And we take the conjunction of those two, so we're going to return true, OK? So has reducible args can call both reducible on the previous slide and itself on this slide. And uh, you know, I was having a little trouble figuring out what to do at this point. And what I realized is that this is kind of like evaluation of functions in Lisp or something like that. OK, so um, let's now work through two examples in great detail. We're going to go through the whole functional loop uh, with one example where the, there are no errors, and then the more interesting example where there is an error. Okay? So I'm going to begin with this source text. Um, and I'm going to look at the corresponding token list. And I'm going to run the parser through all of this. So I begin with an initial state with an empty committed list, C, an empty stack, S, and the index into the tokens at 0, P equals 0. And each time I'm going to play the following game, I look at the token pointed to by the index. I ask, do I shift or reduce? I do that. And then I ask, is, it re is the result reducible? And I take the appropriate action. OK, so let's play the game. So the token at index 0 is the string this is. The stack is empty, so my rule says shift it onto the committed list after converting it to an expression value. The token index is now at 1. Uh, the token at index 1 is LB for left bracket. 
my rule says shift it onto the stack. I do that. The token index is now two. The token at that index is a string token. Again, I'm going to shift it. Oh, and by the way, each time I'm uh, looking to see whether the stack is reducible, but it's not, so I just keep going. Okay, but keep that in mind. I'm, I'm doing that behind the scenes. Okay, now the index is three. The token at index three is a string token. My rule says shift it onto the stack. I'm out of room on my slide, so I have to copy it to the next one. And there it is. The token index is four. The corresponding token is a right bracket. I shift it onto the stack. And this time when I ask, is the stack reducible, the answer is yes. And so I convert the, what's on the stack to a value of type expression, push it onto the committed list. Whoops, uh, I was supposed to have something else that happened there. I clear the stack, I'll increase the token pointer, and I continue. So now the token index is at six, and um, let's see, is there something at six? Uh, da, 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 da. I'm finished, okay? So I'm finished because there are no more tokens to be acquired, and the stack is empty. I'm finished in the sense that A, I've used all the tokens, and B, uh, the stack is empty, so it's a correct processing of the tokens. And so I get something that renders like that. This is strong stuff with strong in italics. Okay, um, so what happens if there is an error? Well, here's some source text with an error. Uh, there's a missing right bracket, and I want it to parse, as I showed in the demo, to something that looks like that when rendered looks like this. The bracket I should be highlighted in pink, okay? So we're gonna begin as we did before. We have the source text, we have the associated list of tokens, and we're gonna run our machine. And when we run the machine, we get to the following state after six loops. Uh, the committed list has the first string uh, from the tokens, and the stack has the rest of the stuff, and we have no more tokens to, to acquire. So now we're stuck, okay? But we have an error handling strategy, which uh, when we see the actual algorithm, it's implemented by, once again, one of these, some kind of a function that does some pattern matching, okay? And the pattern in this case is what you see at the bottom of the stack, reading from right to left, it's left bracket and a string. And we're gonna take that data and we're gonna use it to, to compute a function element whose name is pink, which will render its body in pink, and its body is a text element with content left bracket i. The next thing we do is we clear the stack and we reset the token index to the index just above what we use to create that function element. So that's token index three, which is now pointing at strong stuff, okay? And we turn the machine back on, and it's going to simply, uh, after you know, all this other stuff has been done, it's going to simply uh, commit, after conversion, the strong stuff, okay? And now the stack is empty, and there are no more tokens to be acquired, so we are done, and that list of expressions is rendered as you see below. So that's the basic idea. It's a very simple example, but once you understand that example, you can do everything else that you need to do. Okay, so you can actually write down a recovery algorithm, and I'll show you the, you know, a good part of it here uh, in sort of a simplified case. So I'll call this recover from error. It's a function that transforms state to state, and it operates as follows. Uh, when you, you first of all look at the reversed stack, and you're gonna do some pattern matching on it. So just as we saw in the example, if the reverse stack looks like left bracket and a string token, then you do the following. You push uh, something onto the committed list. It's an error element, you know, it's a, it's a function element that you create out of the left bracket and the string token. Then you clear the stack and you restart the parser at the appropriate index. And then there's some other patterns that you have to match when I've listed some of them below, okay? So that's really all there is to it. Uh, so again, the, you know, the shifting part is totally brainless. You have to think some to figure out 
the correct pattern matching for the error recovery algorithm. Um, so um, to conclude, I'd like to talk about a couple of the other issues. Uh, uh, a real quick overview of the compiler pipeline, which goes as follows. You start with some source text, and you apply a state machine that only looks at the beginnings of lines and converts the source text into a list of primitive blocks. So primitive blocks are, well, you saw blocks in the beginning there, you know, sort of like paragraphs. And uh, the, the main part of a primitive block is just that text. There's some other information like where is it located in the source, uh, by how much is it indented, various other little pieces of metadata. The next thing you do is you transform that into a forest of primitive blocks, a forest being a list of trees. And the tree structure comes from the indentation of the text. Uh, you may remember from high school when you had to do uh, outlines for the, your papers for your English teacher or your Polish teacher. Uh, you, you made an outline. Well, an outline is really a tree. Okay? The next thing you do is you map the parser that we just talked about over those primitive blocks to get a forest of expression blocks. And we're getting close to the end here. The next thing you do is you map a function which I call an accumulator over this. Um, it's going to extract some information and put it into a data structure called docinfo. So it has to read the whole forest. And it, the docinfo structure contains things like cross-reference data, uh, an index if, you've, if you want one of those, uh, numbering for sections and theorems and all sorts of stuff. Okay? And then finally, you take those two pieces of data, the forest of expression blocks and the doc info structure, and you use that to render it into HTML, or in the case of Elm, it's a list of HTML message things. Okay? So the main part was the one that we just talked about, the L0 parser. Um, okay, a quick flash here. I like this function that I used for the accumulator so much, I just had to show you its type signature. So. Uh, extremely cool type signature. It's from Ilias Van Peer's Elm Rose Tree Library. Um, a few final words about blocks. Um, Katya, how am I doing on time? Okay, so just a couple minutes and I'll st stop then. Okay. So uh, blocks exist in all of these languages, but you have to be careful with them because if you've played around with LaTeX, you've certainly had the experience of not properly closing a block, and you know, the results are not always pleasant. Uh, L0 has the advantage that there's no way of not closing a block properly as long as you make it into a block, which means that it's terminated by an empty line. So uh, the design of the language can make your blocks work better for you. Another thing that blocks do is that because L0 parses the contents of blocks, its parse errors cannot escape from the block, and they can't affect other things. Um, uh, I want to go through this slide because we don't really need it, but I want to say a few things about kinds of blocks. They're just ordinary paragraphs. There are what I call ordinary blocks, which have the form, they have a header and they have a body. Okay? The header always starts with a vertical bar and a space, followed by the name of the block, and maybe followed by some arguments. In this case, there aren't any. And that's rendered as, you know, the title, Krakow example that you see up there. There's another uh, ordinary block. And the thing at the bottom is a verbatim block that begins with two vertical bars and it has the same structure, a header and a body. The difference is, is that ordinary, the body of an ordinary block is parsed. The body of a verbatim block is just handed to the renderer as is. The renderer needs to know how to, how to handle it. And a couple of notes. Uh, the way that I handle micro, micro LaTeX and X Markdown is I actually parse them all to the same structure, namely the L0 syntax tree. That way I only have to write one rendering function. And since this is a uh, single man operation, any labor saving benefits I can achieve are, are useful. Uh, another thing you might ask about is speed. Well, you know, the micro LaTeX document I showed in the demo is, you know, it's okay in terms of, of uh, length, but it can actually handle fairly long things because of the use of differential parsing. So again, blocks come into play here because 
The idea is you keep track of which blocks have changed, you reparse those, and stick them into the parse tree in the right place, and zoom you, apply the rest of the compiler pipeline. The parsing stage is the only stage that takes much time. So if you can do that quickly, everything is quick. Uh, and then tests, well, okay, I won't say anything about that. I use round trip tests. So uh, that's it, and I thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank very you, eloquent reducing functions. And yes. I, I love that you end with a forest of expression tree documents or something. Yes, like yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? We don't have any online at the moment. And we have about 10 minutes, if, if anyone does. Ah, oh, I'm going to go up here first. Very slowly, so I don't fall over. <laughs> Hi, James. Thank you. Um, so I would imagine that like, the, the title of the talk was about like, fault-tolerant parsing. Yeah. Uh, but from what I understand, so the purpose of having this forest of yes. expression blocks is actually to even further segregate the area of the input that you're parsing. That, that's correct. I mean, so, uh, like, within uh, each expression block, you are doing this fault-tolerant parsing. That's but right. It's not looking outside of that. That's right. So it isolates the errors. And the, the word forest would not be needed. You could just do a, a list of, of expression blocks. But uh, some of these languages make uh, indentation uh, play a role. So you can have blocks nested with inside blocks, basically. Yeah. And also the birds need somewhere to live, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question here. So my question is for this L0 language, or maybe mini LaTeX. Did you use any of those tools to prepare your today's presentation? Uh, well, actually, um, the, the demo is all, uh, I mean, I used Keynote to prepare the, the, uh, the slides, but the demo is all done using L0, yes, yes. By the way, one thing I should have said is that, uh, you know, you may wonder, does this error recovery process terminate? And it does because, Every time you apply the error recovery function, you reduce the number of tokens that you're, or the number of, uh, yeah, the number of tokens that you're looking at. So, uh, yeah, it's it's guaranteed to terminate. It may not it may not give you a beautiful example result, although it usually does, but it will terminate with some reasonable representation of your source text. Uh, so in this demo, uh, we we could see that there is this theorem block, and it used and it had a number one. So you, I assume that there is a numbering for theorems. Is there yes. a tool for cross-referencing? Yes, yes, yes. The uh, and all that's accomplished by this uh, this accumulate business, the second to the last, the penultimate step in the in the parser pipeline or in the compiler pipeline. So once you have the forest of expression blocks, you run this other function that uh, figures out all of these things. So anything you want numbered is numbered. Any cross-references are resolved. And one advantage of this is that you see the, that pipeline will run every time you make a change. So you don't have to do the thing that you often do in LaTeX where you run the system twice to make sure that things are properly resolved. And I, in the beginning, I, wonder, I really worried about, you know, would having this pipeline in the several stages make things too slow? But I, I did a little bit of benchmarking, and I found that the parsing was the only really expensive step. Uh, so by using this differential parsing, I seem to have, well, so far, so good. I guess that's the best I can say. Yeah. yeah and another question. Uh, so for someone who didn't dig that, that uh, deep into the topic. Um, I mean, what you, uh, what you uh, presented, uh, that you have the um, syntax tree for, for what you parse, it kind of resembles uh, Pandoc. It also has a syntax tree, and maybe you could like, briefly describe how what you've done differs, like what is, or maybe you have considered like, reusing what Pandoc uh -huh. offers already. Yeah. yeah, so you're speaking of Pandoc, is that right? Yeah. Yes, so, um, you know, Pandoc is a, batch processing tool. 
and uh, I haven't used it, but I know people who do it. It's a very, very capable tool that can translate between lots of different formats. It's, uh, I think I was probably unconsciously inspired by Pandoc to use this common L0 syntax, because I know that uh, Pandoc uses a common structure for all the languages that it does. The thing that distinguishes uh, Scripta from Pandoc and also from Overleaf, which is I, I hesitate to say competitor because I'm not competing yet, <laughs> but Overleaf is a online LaTeX tool, but it uses uh, the usual LaTeX tooling. Everything is done on the back end, and the selling point, if there is one for this, is that you have this very fast interactive uh, work. Well, that's one thing. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, real-time processing, and the other thing is, is that it produces uh, HTML as opposed to PDF. But to your question, uh, Pandoc is sort of a batch processing system, and it's also of wider applicability because you can convert between A and B where there's a whole list of what A and B can be. Yeah. So I noticed that stack that was part of your accumulator, if I remember correctly. I'm sorry, uh, say that again? The, the stack. Oh, uh, yes. In, which I think was part of the accumulator, if I remember correctly. No, I, actually, the accumulator works entirely on the forest of expression blocks. It, it, by the time you get to that oh. stage, it's only working on the forest Sorry. of expression okay, blocks. Sorry, okay, so, so with, the, with the stack, given uh, pathological input, mm -hmm. um, could the user crash the runtime? Uh, if it was extremely long input, uh, longer than any document I've ever looked at, um, but that's a good question since you're using a stack. And I'll give you an example of something pathological. Uh, suppose that you have only left brackets or only right brackets. Then, you know, the way it's currently built, especially with right brackets, uh, it doesn't handle that very well. It will handle it. But, uh, you know, to make it crash, you would probably have to have several pages of right brackets. Uh, a simple brain fuck program. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You bet.